So, yeah. Hello, Australian Sana. Welcome to uh, the podcast. Thanks for being here. Welcome back again. Thank you. That's all right. Um, it's been way too long. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, apologies. I kind of forgot Deborah. how long it's been. <laughs> been over a year weren't we gonna yeah. do one of these a month but <laughs> I, I don't know do we even get the listenership for that like i don't know maybe if people tuned in more then i'd be more inclined yeah yeah maybe um but that's it's, it it's the old paradox it's the paradox you need to be generating content to create the audience but you need the audience to be tuning in to generate the content so yeah that's right we're it's stuck easy. between a rock and a hard place it is. we're too new goo yeah, that's it. We're two new goo. You know, if you want more comebacks from the new goo podcasters, mm-hmm. then you got to fund it. Show your financial support. Yeah, yeah. You didn't get any alcohol donations, so that's why you're sober right now. I assume you're sober. Unfortunate but true. Unfortunate but true. <laughs> cool. Um, so before we get into it, what's been going on in your world lately? Oh, a lot. <laughs> I do think there's been a time in the last year where I have not been busy with some variation of work-related things. The wrestling thing is still a thing that's happening, so there's the training that's all involved with that. And uh, a bunch debuted. of medical shit. Which... You, you, Pardon? You debuted as a wrestler. Yeah, yeah, it finally happened. I had a match. Awesome. How, did, how, how did it go? Tell us about it. I was really happy with it. It's been a, like, obviously for anybody who has been following this over a longer term, it's been a very long time coming. I've, uh, I actually counted the amount of days between when I first started training and debuting, and it was 1,396 days. So uh, definitely put a lot of work into it. That's a lot. That's that's, that's a that's a K-pop level uh, training period. Real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Cool. So, and it came with a bunch, of, and much like the K-pop experience, it also came with a bunch of trauma with it too. So I love that for me. <laughs> yeah, you are now even more authentically qualified to comment on the K-pop world. Trust you? me. I, oh, oh, there is like such a big thing that I'm trying to get more people to understand. And it is uh, my friend Glitterotic on Twitter. Hmm. Um, we have an agenda that is basically K-pop is wrestling and wrestling is K-pop. So it's like, if you're a fan of one, you really should be a fan of the other. You just don't realize it yet. So how are they similar? How are you making this correlation? Oh, 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 oh. Uh, so one, you've got the extensive training period before a debut. So I'll start off right with that, with that one. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've got like stage names for idols, like V or IU. And mm-hmm. then you've got your wrestling names. So yep. like The Rock, for example, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Hmm. Um, and then like with your K-pop, you've got your prescribed personality, like where each person is basically playing a character within a group in the group dimension. So you've got like the cool one, the funny one, the cute one, the leader, and like wrestling is very much very character based as well. So it's like, you know, Stone Cold is the anti-authoritarian figure. And then Hulk Hogan is essentially the, like, super Americana guy who's uh, unsurprisingly now gone down the hard right pipeline with the Trump endorsement and such. But, mm. yeah, lots of stuff. Like, yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Um, cool, we'll have some wrestling questions for you later on in the... Oh, in fuck, this yeah. Too. So they'll save them to the end. That- that, that'll keep me tuning in and, like, doing this more. So if you keep the wrestling questions coming, Australian Sana will return. Yes, yes. Um, uh, listeners, please pay heed and we'll, we'll <laughs> do another one. We'll, we won't leave it a year and three months next time. Or we'll try not six to. We'll try not to. If, if there's we'll more try questions. And, yeah. yeah. We'll try and fit one in before the end of 2024 if we're lucky. All right, um, so I've categorized the different questions into different things. So we're going to start off Ooh. with the ones that are most relevant to K-pop. Okay, good. Um, so starting off with uh, the Fromus 9 situation, um, mm-hmm. which is them basically being in the dungeon. Um, someone's basically yeah. asked, uh, we actually had a, quite a lot of questions about this, but I'll just read one of them because okay, they're so. all essentially versions of the same question. Um, gotcha. Which is, I think that the Framus 9 situation is proof that the various subsidiaries of HYBE are autonomous 
as Fromus yeah. has been kept in the dungeon for long periods of time, which is perfectly in sync with Pletus's long-established pattern of misogyny, as we saw with yeah. After School and Priston. What are your thoughts on this? Oh, good person to ask that question from. Um, so I think if you're talking about misogyny within a K-pop company, you're going to find that so well across the board. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's a Pletus exclusive, although they were a very good example of it. Hmm. Hybe. Hybe is also extremely up there in that regard. So I don't think that they're really changing anything for Pletus. They, and even if, like, again, I don't even know how to properly articulate this. It's just that idea that, you know, if they, if they hadn't come from Pletus, if they maybe come from a different company, they would probably still be in this kind of situation as well. Um, I saw this really good comment. I can't remember where it was from. Pretty sure it was like the comment section on a Panchoa article or whatever. But it was basically saying that, like, so much of Hybe's management is essentially Bung Shi Huk is an egomaniac mm. and he wants the credit of creating BTS. But then he's mad that BTS kind of got that credit for themselves, which they rightfully deserve. And then his other attempts so far with a bunch of these other groups, like in Hypen, for example, or um, TXT for the other one as well, like, they're selling. They're, but they're, they're not, not blowing up in the that next BTS, BTS going away. They're yeah. definitely not the next BTS. Mm. And then you have the girl groups that he's trying to launch. So you've had the Seraphim, who haven't been without their issues. And then you've also got New Jeans, which is possibly going to get into in more detail in the podcast, depending on the questions and such. But like the biggest thing to take away from that is that he doesn't get the credit for New Jeans. Min Hee Jin does. Yeah. So he's mad as fuck. So he's essentially sabotaging potentially one of the most profitable groups to come out of the company within um, after BTS because he doesn't get the credit for creating them. Mm. And that's why he's trying so hard to push Illit. That's why he's trying so hard to push the Seraphim at the moment. And he's trying to shove New Jeans in the dungeon. And that's essentially where Fromus would also come in as well, because Fromus would not be a Bungshi Hook creation. You've also got G-Friend and the shit that happened to them. So, like, obviously me and all the buddy girlies were very much like, we told you this years ago, we, we told you this kind of shit was going to happen. As soon as New Jeans was coming out and we saw all the shit about Min Hee Jin being associated with them, we were trying to warn you, like, hey, there's a reason people from SM were trying to get rid of her and we're happy to see her go. She's not a good person. You don't want her associated with them. And, like... Yeah, the content she creates for them is great, but the um, person behind the content is not a good person either. So it's not like one side is right. It's actually both sides are fucking horrible and these are young girls caught in the middle. Mm. Um, and yeah. Fromus kind of gets lumped into, I guess, the G-Friend side of things where they were acquired to try and basically inflate the stock value and uh, basically like take credit for anything positive that does come from them if they continue to be successful but at the same time they can't claim entirely to be able to say that they created the group so therefore they're kind of getting like, lost in the lost in the shuffle yep so yeah I actually had seen that take on um, Twitter a little while back probably because I retweeted it <laughs> yeah um, yeah might have been you might have might have been someone else too I, it's not and yeah. not not even the second time I've heard that I've heard it more than twice mm. Um, mm. but it does more seem than what? <laughs> more than what? it seems to <laughs> seems to add up um, so yeah yes um, everything is connected we're through the looking glass here people hmm Next question. Now that we have international K-pop girl groups, in, in mm -hmm. quotes, i.e. having non-East Asian members, from large okay. K-pop companies like Vichar from JYP, Katsai from HYBE, do you think that they'll have racist backlash from stands like, say, EXP Edition and Karchi suffered? Oh. I, I'm theorising that the desire to dick ride for large K-pop corporations will overwhelm their racist desires to shit upon groups for having non-East Asian members. This is a really interesting take because especially with Cat's Eye, um, like, there's kind of a difference between when the group was being put together based on Weverse for Envody and then now the TV show or the documentary quote unquote around documentary being aired on Netflix that there is this difference in reaction from the K-pop fan side of things and then the general public so that I, I'm again you're going into the whole definition of racism stuff but like you've got Emily who is a white girl 
and she is a very, 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 very talented dancer. If you watch any of her videos that she posts on her Instagram page, I think she's on TikTok as well. She's really, really good. Like, as in landslide better than any of the other people on that show. Hmm. But her votes, in terms of how people voted for her when it was with the K-pop, like within it was within the K-pop demographic only, she she got very very low on the votes. Like, I'm pretty sure at one point she got like 15th or something out of 18. Um, so I think that there is definitely this perception and it's come from people who were in the space before, especially people like your grifters, like Chad Future, that when white people try to go into K-pop and this is not, this is not Emily. This is what I guess K-pop fans perceive a white person as in the K-pop space because of the actions of people before them, that it's like seen as grifting, that it's seen as being like the easier way to try and get into the music industry. Because if, you could just get in like you wouldn't you just go to say america or wouldn't you try to be breaking in in the us Hmm. um i also think that there's a really big difference between uh k-pop and j-pop as well so i find that j-pop is a lot more like there's a word for it i don't know the word and it's in japanese and it's basically used to describe the foreigners that are a part of j-pop groups because there have been more foreigners within the japanese music industry because Japanese music industry is essentially just as big as, if not bigger than America. So because of that, there have been internationals who do go over to Japan and do try and make a career in Japan. Whereas Korea has been very, very insular for a very, very long time. And it's only recently with the whole how you in the last 10 years or so that it's really taken off that you actually now then get the impact of that globalization and now people actually seriously wanting to go over and be part of the Korean scene. Um, So yeah, I think there is a way for it to happen. Um, I think that it's just going to be a lot of, for any person, particularly of a white background, having to prove that you're taking it seriously and that you're not just seeing it as like a cheaper, easier way of trying to break in compared to... um, oh, I could do, America's too hard, I'm just going to go to Korea instead and make a career off the, you know, easier market that can be how it is perceived. But, like, if you're learning the language, if you're doing the same training as all the other trainees, I don't see why it shouldn't be an option. Yeah. I don't know if I'd characterize someone like Chad Future as a grifter as such, because, I mean, it's pretty clear that he did have a passion for it. I mean... Yeah, passion, maybe talent. No, but yeah. he, was, he was very much like a net. Like I know, I don't think nepo baby is the right word because I don't think his parents are in the industry. But I know that he had very wealthy parents, and he was yeah. just doing it as like a passion project, basically. Yeah, well, that's that's my point. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying he was particularly good at it. <laughs> yeah, but um, but I don't think mm. he was in there in bad faith either. Mm. I, I good th- point. Yeah. Um, I think it, I think it then just becomes unfortunate that because he is then instead more of the that nepo baby lack of talent, but there because of connection, it then unfortunately gives everyone else who then tries to come after him that sort of association that they're not actually talented, that yeah. they've just got white industry connections. Maybe. Although I don't know if people even remember him now. I mean, I, yeah. I, when I spoke to Ollie London, he didn't even know who Chad Future was. Um, oh, that was but you, the fact that Ollie London is again another name that comes forth, and you see the kind of shit think, that I he's think, doing I, now. That's definitely a grifter. Yeah, I think he is full in the full grifter space now, and I think he's probably Absolutely. done a lot more um, damage than Chad ever did. Yes, <laughs> good point. Good point. I agree. I agree. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like that pipeline, essentially. <laughs> yes. Um, next question: um, Aion, the centre member of Baby Monster aka the Mm. jenny slash cl equivalent of 381 Mm. seems Mm -hmm. to have a fairly unique look e.g a non-standard nose do you think that Mm. she'll get prettier for her 20th birthday and lose said unique facial features within the next five years oh that's sad i hope she doesn't but you know the standards of industry pressure and how they've uh, particularly uh angled at women 
it, it, let's just say it wouldn't surprise me if it happened but i also hope that maybe because of how popular she is like the fact that i know her name hmm. when i actively try to avoid baby monster content because of how young that group is and the fact that yg is involved in their production even after the whole burning sun gate when he supposedly was leaving the company i think that's fucking ridiculous that you're allowing that man near minors hmm. um but yeah indication of how popular or you know it girl potential that she is so i can't imagine her nose visually in my head like i can't exactly imagine her but i've got a vague idea of her face so hoping that her impact popularity wise within the group because i know that chart wise they had a pretty big difference between the first song that didn't have her in it and then the next one which did maybe they'll kind of try and leave her as natural as possible but you know that's that's being optimistic yeah well this, this, i guess part of the sad thing about things like that in the k-pop industry is no one actually needs to go and tell aeon i'll mm. go and fix your nose you know the artists mm -hmm. the artists do it because you know they feel the pressure and it doesn't even need mm -hmm. to be directly stated and no. yeah I, I think she'll probably get it done eventually i think it'll be like neon mm. with the bunny teeth because people mm. loved neon from twice and they liked her teeth a lot and it was like a really popular mm. feature you know there's whole fan communities that are named after her teeth and they call themselves bunny because she had the bunny teeth you know it was mm. considered a real cute part of her appeal and then she got her teeth fixed um mm. so obviously she was feeling the pressure to the point where even the fan um positive reinforcement wasn't enough which is really sad yeah it is hmm. um and i like the teeth too i thought they were cute so you know there you go. Mm. They, these idols, they don't consult with me. They just go and do stuff. Mm. It's terrible. How dare um, they? <laughs> um, what are three K-pop songs that would be improved by adding Mongolian throat singing? Oh, I understand this is a reference to something, but I'm trying to think of what like the Mongolian throat singing is coming from because I feel like it's familiar. <laughs> like, where is this reference? Yeah, is that I, like you've said in the past. Um, have I brought it up before in? stuff maybe once or twice but hmm. i don't really remember um uh straight off the bat uh, i'm gonna say nct sticker because i don't think there's anything you could do to that song that would make it worse <laughs> you're not a fan um hang on just that's one <laughs> some crackly audio issues here give me a moment Mm hmm. Hmm. All right. Say something. Uh, yeah, because you kind of oh, cut cool. out a bit then. Yep. Cool. Okay. We're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we are so back. Yep. Okay. So NCT sticker. Yeah, can't really make that worse, so hopefully the Mongolian throat singing could potentially even make it a little better. Uh, similar opinion to that guy from TXT who just went solo. I listened to that, and I was like, oh, dear God, you're, you, that, that, that's a solo. Uh, good luck with that. So maybe uh, less auto-tune, more Mongolian throat singing. Mm -hmm. that, that, that'll be number two. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, it's like when I don't like a song, I particularly go out of my way to not listen to it rather than be able to identify it. So what's a bad song that's come out recently? <laughs> I feel like I'll let you chime in for number three. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe a little Psy Showtime. Um, mm. I, I, I think just having um, the, the throat singing coming in in the middle of that would kind of be a cool interlude. Mm. Uh, just stop the baby squawking. But yeah, I was when I got that question, I thought, yeah, it's... I was thinking about bad songs, not good songs, because mm -hmm. you don't need to improve a mm. good song. Exactly. Mm. Don't break. It's a, don't need to fix what's not broken. <laughs> yes, it. If you were a Korean man doing his military service, what currently active K-pop girl group would you have as your uh, no currently active K-pop girl would you have as your pinup poster in your barracks dorm room? Oh, weird question, because I feel like with the whole misogyny shit that's going down in South Korea, if I woke up in the body of a Korean man contributing to the suicide rate. Um, <laughs> hmm. Oh, I'm getting cancelled for that one. Um, <laughs> I don't know, because, like, again, it's the whole... Mm. 
this this is the weird thing for me in terms of like who would I objectify if I woke up as a male one day? I'm like I don't want to objectify women. I am women. <laughs> well, that's alright. You can pass on this one if you don't know. Yeah, I'm gonna pass on that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, question asker. His Australian son's mm -hmm. got no idea. Yeah. Um. Anyone who wants my opinion can just go to my bias list, but to be honest. But I've never been a posters on walls kind of person. Mm, actually, um, same, because, like, I've never been allowed to have posters up in my house when I was growing up as a kid because we rented. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've never been big on that. Um, when Yeah, when I was growing up, I didn't have posters. After I moved out, I, I had posters for about a year, and I just took them all down because I thought, well, it's kind of stupid, really. <laughs> um, like, I've, I've got a whole bunch of K-pop posters that people have given me over the years and stuff stashed in my house, yeah. and I don't want to put them up because it's like, yeah. um, a you ruin them, and b it's... well, they can actually look nice if you frame them. I had for a while, I had some in, in, like a couple of infinite posters because that was the compromise I had when I was living with my parents. Is they don't like the look of posters, so even though mm. eventually they did manage to buy a house, and that's like way before the economy exploded the way it did. Um, um, then when we finally could put posters up when I was like 12, they were like, no, you're not putting posters up because we don't like them. So I was mm. like, well, shit. But yep. their compromise was then you could pick one or maybe two mm. and we'll get them like put up in a frame on the, on the wall. And it actually looks quite nice. So it can be done. But uh, again, like the only answer I possibly have to that is just the fact that I've got a Ning Ning photo card in my phone, but I have that in my phone because she talked about being ADHD in an interview and I'm like, oh, samesies. So mm. it's again, it's like, I relate to her as a person. I don't objectify her as an object. So I'm like, I don't want to do that if I suddenly become a guy. <laughs> um, next question. Would you drink Jay Park soju? Oh. <laughs> uh instinctive gut reaction to soju i i had some bad times on that but i've had some good times on it as well so 50 50 ratio um depends if there's flavored ones i don't like the straight taste of soju because it basically just tastes like nail polish remover but um mm. if it's like the flavored peach one i like the peach flavored sojus yeah i've only ever seen the j park one as a straight one although i've never seen yeah. it seen it but in the ads yeah, i've seen yeah, it online it's yeah. just a you know, I mean, you know, props to one. him. Like, I think that's actually a very smart thing to do, the way that so many celebrities are kind of trying to expand into non-music-related business ventures. Like, I know that Kendall Jenner has her tequila line. Um, Beyonce has got that new whiskey line. So it's like, yeah, if a Korean does soju, then that's a smart that's a smart thing for them to be doing. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, obviously soju is Korean. So if, if he's the first person to come up with that as an idea, good for him. Yeah. Which is more pretentious marketing, uh, XG's X Pop or Kanye's Art Pop from his 808s huh. and Heartbreaks era? Interesting. I'm going to say JoJo Shoe was gay pop. <laughs> what? JoJo Shiwa, she's saying that she's making gay pop, like K pop, but gay because she's a lesbian. So, <laughs> all right. Okay. She tried, but she will never be Chapel Roan. <laughs> I mean, like, if you're going to be asking that question, I think there's a terrible, like, you know, Kanye's obviously a pretentious twat. I called that from the beginning. I was saying he was insufferable even when everyone was calling him a genius. So yeah, me so too. I, usual, I always hated that everyone. ticket. <laughs> it's like right from the start. <laughs> never I, thought he was I never any thought he was a genius. I never thought he was a genius. I enjoy some of his songs, but, like, even the one that everyone gives him the most credit for, which I think everyone loves to always talk about how great Stronger is. It's like, that's a fucking Daft Punk song, cunt. He's, his best song is hardly even his. Mm. But whatever. Um, and I know that he did production work for Jay-Z, so it's like, he's not bad as a producer because I like the stuff that he did with Jay-Z, but it's like, him by himself, he needs other people to work with, to collaborate with. It's like, he's good when working with a team, but he's not this, like, Mozart genius of rap or whatever music genre he goes with um r&b i guess uh the other one xg pop well it's like i don't really care about that because essentially every single group has been trying to like end mix pop is the other one that's the other yeah, they all want to be recently. they want to be a new genre don't they 
Yeah, everyone wants to be a new genre now because of fucking BTS pop. So it's like, it's just you're, you're Korean making K-pop, and obviously um, XG pop can't really be K-pop because they're not Korean and they're not singing in Korean. So like, okay, they're not gonna be K-pop. They gotta be something. They're kind of mm. J-pop because I'm pretty sure they're all Japanese, but they're singing it. Pardon me, singing in English. So it's like, yeah, that makes sense for them to come up with a couple of letters for it. Yeah. Have you watched the Aespa animated series? I have no. Oh, wait. I've seen one video, I'm pretty sure. I didn't know there was a series. Apparently. I, I haven't seen it, so. I um, might tune in. I, I mean, I, I, like I said, I've got the Ning Ning photo cards. I do like it. Mm. I, am, I am sat and tuned in for Aespa. Okay. But yeah, okay, we'll have to pass on that question because neither of us have seen it, so. Mm. Never mind. Um. Do you think it's true that male idols are more sexualized these days than their female colleagues? Seems like every clip I see from a boy group performance has them in BDSM-esque leather gear. I think boy groups have an easier time doing sexy concepts than girl groups because they're male. Female idols will be slut-shamed for risque fashion, while male idols will be praised and thirsted over. Do you think the guys feel empowered by their outfits or just uncomfortable or embarrassed? Mm, good question. Uh, I am cringing at the same time hearing it because like there's parts of it that I disagree with, but I understand what the person is saying. Um, so it's not that female idols are not sexualized. It's as you've written about extensively mm. that the sexualization that happens to them is presented as being pure and basically virginal. Yeah, so it's a different. That's what they kind of. Yeah, they're very different. Not, they're, mm. Yeah. So it's like it's it's kind of yeah it's very insidious. So when we see these like cute or innocent or teen crush concepts, it may on the surface appear like they're trying to appeal to the girl fans, but a lot of the male fans that are, uh, I guess as you would say, putting up posters in the military are kind of like they're wanting a young idol. Like, what was her name? Sharon from Eugene. She's like, what? She was 13 when she debuted? Just mm. turned 14? And, like, I'm pretty sure one of the guys from GOT7 referred to her as his ideal type. And it's like, no, jail, straight away with you. Like, leave the poor children alone. So it's, um, I, I don't disagree that men or the male idols seem to have more overt sexualized concepts. Mm. And that there is slut shaming that does go along with any woman who does do more of that AOA era concept. But, um... Yeah, unfortunately, it's just the fact that innocent sexualization uh, seems to be the more profitable way of uh, sexualizing girls. And in a lot of cases, they are underage girls. It, it has and then a, on the same point. Yeah, it has a couple of advantages for the companies. One, obviously, being the plausible deniability of it. Yeah. Um, and the other one being that they can be more easily marketed in more conservative countries that would probably balk at a lot of female skin exposure. Mm -hmm. And then just like as a side note as well, I think I mentioned that guy from TX2 here. I'm pretty sure his name's Yonjun. I apologize if that is the wrong name. And like, I, 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 I roasted him because he used auto-tune in the song and whatnot. Sure, he's the first male idol to do that. But like, I saw the brief clip that did come up in my Twitter feed and it was like, crotch grab! Split on the floor, humping, thrust, hip thrust, hip thrust, and it was like, okay, I, 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 I see the um, marketing intention behind this. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it, I've, I've always found it very weird with how very hypersexualized overtly that a lot of these concepts can be. Because it's like, I guess they're trying to appeal to, oh, like the women, like mm. women. I'm like, girl, girls, are we interested? Because it's, it's never never me i like never has a male idol like ripping off his shirt to show his ass or like viciously hip thrusting into the air and grabbing his crotch ever been appealing to me yeah. so i'm like <laughs> is this is this what you're like are y'all buying this is that the reason you're buying this you, it, 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 it confuses me but um okay <laughs> obviously someone's into it or they wouldn't do it yeah yeah um, like they have the numbers and they have like female fans at their concerts when they go overseas and the screaming and stuff and it's just like uh, okay i mean when i had that little crush that i did have on song Yeol from infinite i always liked him because he had the long hair and i thought half ponytail that is a fucking look on you 
but never to do with like abs, yeah. hip thrust, groin. <laughs> <laughs> um, next question um, have you watched the HBO TV series The Idol co-starring Jenny from Blackpink if so what did you think <laughs> oh, that maybe a slightly a related wreck. question in some ways yeah uh, absolute train wreck I didn't watch it through properly because yeah I find The Weeknd insufferable I find Sam Levinson insufferable how far did you get through the... it <laughs> oh, not even the first episode. Oh, it was right. like, I knew about the storyline originally and that it originally had like a female writer and a female director and they were really going to do a lot with the character of Jocelyn. And then Weekend comes in, Levinson comes in and it's basically just like, once again, another like barely, barely thinly veiled like porno series. Um, uh, I watched like the clips of Jenny in it, so you know I hope things take off, for her, continue to take off for her. She seems to be doing well with that recent launch of her website to potentially launch an upcoming album. So tuned in for that. Um, I actually really enjoyed watching. I really like D'Angelo Wallace, like D'Angelo. He does this YouTube commentary series, and he did like a takedown of the idol and like analyzed everything. And I'm like, yeah, it's probably like an hour long. But it, if not ours, but he sums up everything way better than what I would be able to. So I highly recommend watching his like reaction to it. All right, cool. I, I didn't even bother to watch it, to be honest. I mean, I don't, I generally miss dramas with idols in them, mm. period. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was aware of a lot of the dialogue around it at the time. But, yeah. And, and that none was of very much like, yeah. Cringe. And none of it really oh, made oh, me want to uh, me... check it out. <laughs> Yeah, I'm having like war flashbacks of the actual dialogue. I'm like, God, I'd suppress that. Mm. Ugh. Um, next question. Um, a growing market seems to be AI chatbot girlfriends or boyfriends. If or when K-pop agencies started offering chatbot companion based on the eyeballs, would you try them? Also, what sort of effects do you think that the chatbot companions would have on the fandom sphere? Uh, weird. Um, I think there was one at one point. Like, I remember I didn't use it, but I think I knew a friend who did that. It was like, uh, this is a long time ago as well, but it was, there was some sort of chatbot that existed. And then like, it got into controversy because it was basically fishing for information from the people talking to it, which is like <laughs> least surprising news ever. So for very mm. obvious reasons, no, I would not be using it. Um, I feel like, again, it's an interesting thing that like so many companies and this is hardly k-pop exclusive it's un unfortunately literally everywhere that i look whether it's like the new iphone the new samsung the new motorola any sort of tech it's always advertised right now like now with ai and it's like do you not realize that for a lot of people this is uh, almost a reason to go out of our way to not use your product not to advertise us for us to use it because I AI is so much of it is just billionaires throwing money at it trying to make it stick when the actual people really aren't that interested um but and again a lot of people will have different opinions on that um it's yeah it's been becoming it's been a lot of talk lately that AI is starting to become a bit of a bubble because like like hmm, a bubble that's about to I. burst because you know there's a lot of companies investing like billions of dollars into it but no hmm. one's really found a way to make money from it yet i mean okay. it just hasn't yeah, really been so profitable. much of it oh i could i could rant on ai for a very very long time as someone who is a quote air quote artist like mm. i draw but i also draw using pens and paper so i'm not the kind of graphic designer whose job is at risk from this sort of technology mm. but it's just so much of it is a race to the bottom and it's indicative of a bigger problem in terms of capitalist society and how it's about maximizing profits at the expense of essentially literally everything and then it's it's kind of late stage capitalism now where it's like it's at the expense of the consumer and i'm like who the fuck do you think is buying your products and therefore giving you the capital if you're trying to force us to consume slop we're not going to give you our money so therefore you deserve to go bankrupt but it's like businesses particularly run by billionaires are like no 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 we're so smart you just don't understand how genius we are because we're so smart it's like no you're all fucking idiots who are just surrounded by yes men um so yeah ai not particularly interested i think that a lot of it's ironic because i will on one hand say like oh the reason that the parasocial relationships that exist within k-pop are because you're actually 
thinking about a real human, but then at the same time, this real human, whoever you are a fan of, is also very much a scripted persona that's micromanaged by a company. So it's like, it's more the illusion that it is a person that you're obsessed with. Meanwhile, AI, it's like straight away, there's no illusion. So it's shattered. So there's no incentive. Yep. In my opinion. Yep. <laughs> yeah, as for this fandom stuff and how that's going to play out, it's I've actually um, been surprised by how um, much the fandom has been rejecting AI stuff. They have they generally yeah. haven't been going along with it, which is you know yeah. a little little beacon of hope. I think <laughs> that was quite Probably surprising enough, yeah. for me. Yeah, I guess I wouldn't necessarily say it's a surprise, just because of like the fact that it's just stolen content in a lot of cases, and it's also extremely lacking human connection which is what so many people seek whenever it is our um fun time compared to say work yeah. time like whenever it's a hobby or an interest often you're doing that in part because humans at the end of the day are social creatures so we seek that connection yeah um it's a good point um because i guess the um the whole reason why a lot of fandoms are into the the k-pop stuff is because of that connection and uh i guess they realize that ai is not really capable of giving them that same connection so that's why they reject it if, it, mm -hmm. if it, yeah so makes sense um uh and yeah probably related as well um john cook has been doing lives fairly recently like fairly frequently is there anything mm -hmm. you want to talk about about that and power of social relationships setting boundaries or anything else with reference to these have you seen uh, his in lives? terms of like no actually again just because i don't really tune in that much over any particular celebrity mm. but like i did like his recent instagram post that's made from his dog's account where he was basically <laughs> um supporting new jeans and it just sent tiny seven twitter into a meltdown because they've mm. been coming up with all these excuses like he's actually saying it to support yungi and like was hacked and every other excuse you can think of and now the excuse is oh but he's actually talking about against Min Hee Jin he's not talking about the company like you know they'll always come up with a reason but just the fact it sent them into a spiral was hilarious so good for him <laughs> the, the latest excuse these days any anytime K-pop fans see something they don't like they'll say it's a deep fake that <laughs> <laughs> you've given video evidence of something happening i didn't like it. oh it's, it's a definitely a deep fake mm -hmm. um all right next questions is these are the australian questions a lot of people Ooh. are curious about aspects of australia so they're asking us about right. these things um and and there's and i've sort of lumped the, some the new gene stuff in here as well because that's all mm -hmm. it's kind yep, of two australian members in there yes so danielle hanny and to a lesser extent bluey are the most culturally mm -hmm. relevant things to happen to your lame ass country in 38 years it's crocodile dundee yes so are you uh, don't disrespect rose from blackpink like that thank you very much <laughs> are you fucking grateful to queen minhi jin Ooh, uh, <laughs> not to Minhee Jin specifically, but well, she, um, she's like, the one who got him up there. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll give her the credit for that, but at the same time, I think she should also be in jail. So, <laughs> <laughs> related question: If you had young underage daughters, would you trust Minhee Jin to babysit them? Oh dear God, no! If I had underage daughters, I would never be letting them anywhere near a K-pop company. Doesn't matter which one it is. And, like, so much of the relationship with them I've been very outspoken on is just textbook grooming. It's, like, the buying them presents and, like, expensive gifts. And it's hmm. the fact that when, again, it's been bothering me so much because I've tried to find the link since and I just haven't been able to find it because Google's gone to fucking shit. Thanks, AI. But, um... There was an interview that Minhee Jin did that was pre-debut. It was like before New Jeans was coming out, but like they were started, like the the members had been announced, that kind of stuff. Mm. And they asked her like, oh, what are the personalities of the trainees like? And she was like, oh, well, I could talk about each of them for so long, but I'll, because everyone's interested in the muck nail, I'll go with her. And then she talked about how like, I'm, again, I'm, I apologize if I'm getting the names mixed up. I think it's Heron, who is mm. the youngest one, or yeah, Heron. I, I don't get even them know. confused name-wise. <laughs> I know there's Heron and Heron. Heron, right. 
Heyrin. Yeah. The the, the young youngest one. member. <laughs> yeah, she's thir- She was thirteen at debut. So as a trainee, she would have even been younger. And Min Hee Jin was talking about like she comes over to my house and we go out for lunch together. And then like at first we talk like colleagues, but then she's become like a real friend. I'm like, what kind of fucking grown adult are you? to be fostering that kind of relationship with a young child like that is barely a teenager like i am 32 i know of younger people basically like friends who have kids or friends who have relatives or like sometimes at wrestling we have younger fans and that kind of stuff and it's like there is a very, very clear difference between interacting with someone that age as, like, appreciating them and, like, wanting them to grow up and become a person and then seeing them as a peer. And mm. that's just not appropriate. So, yeah, anytime there's anything to do with Minhee it's just very much, like, vomit emoji, vomit emoji, vomit emoji. <laughs> Get those girls away from her. <laughs> Do you think she is a child predator, or do you think she's like Absolutely how how predator? How, how bad do you think she predatory. really is? Um, I know at one point on her Instagram, she had pictures that were up on display that were of like a minor or someone who looked to be a minor that was shirtless, and yeah. it was like something something came out about that in the news at one point, and again with smear campaigning that's going on against Min Hee Jin. I am so surprised they haven't actually tried to use this because this is actually problematic. That's probably um, probably because the rest of them do similar things. Almost. Exactly. Because <laughs> <just, yeah, laughs> she's probably but, got the same kind of dirt on them. Exactly. Yeah, I'm aware of all that stuff, but but more yeah. the question is how um you know how dangerous is she really, do you think? I mean, I, look, I, mean uh, I mean there's uh, one thing about putting someone on your wall is one thing, but that doesn't yeah, necessarily just, make you a predator. I, no, Most, basically I agree, creepy maybe, but it's just but, you know. definitely creepy. But it means that the thought is there. Mm. So even if she's not acting on it, she should definitely not be in a position where she could do it if she wanted to. And that's the kind of relationship she's kind of built with those girls. That, like, if anything bad ever happened, which, as you can see, it is happening now, they overly are rationalizing and coming to her defense way more than what a standard employee-employer relationship should be. Hmm. so it's 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 giving major major red flag vibes obviously don't want anything to ever be happening to idols that are under her control or care but it's just it's it's dangerous it's definitely dangerous and you've seen and we've all heard the kind of stories that maybe come out 10 years later and it's like you just really really hope that in 10 years that they don't come out to say things that are happening at the moment hmm. oh i guess yeah. i think um yeah, again, when you go back to, like, the SM side of things, you've got, like, Taemin and uh, Yeri from Red Velvet, who've also seemed to have, like, vaguely hinted at, like, not being comfortable working with her when they were minors. At- hmm. And she was in creative control of their direction. So it's just, like, this is a woman who should not be in control of um, uh, not being near teenagers. Yep. Um, next question. Do you also stand Lily from NMIX out of Australian obligation? Hell yes. Vocal <laughs> queen. Waiting for the solo album. Yeah, cool. <laughs> um, more Australian questions. Um, have you heard of the Canadian village of Whistler? Um, yeah. It's apparently home to so many Australians that it's been dubbed Wistralia. <laughs> the name I have heard, but I did not know that about it. Yeah. I've, like, I've heard of a name like Whistler, but I, I didn't know what. That's, that's a fun fact. I wonder if it's hot or cold. It's um, like, you know, Canada's a big country too. It's a bit of a ski town, apparently. Um, <gasps> oh, I'm so jealous. Yeah. I would, so straight away it's appealing to me as an Australian. I want to go there. <laughs> the person like who the, the person who asked this question linked a big article, which I'm not going to just read out, but yeah. basically yeah. it just asking, you know, why are all these Australians here? And the article unfortunately doesn't really answer the question, um, but mm. it, it basically says all the Australians are there because a lot of other Australians are there. So the Australians yeah. kind of flock together, which doesn't really answer how they got there in the first place. But apparently, yeah, it's like it's like a ski resort kind of place. Oh, that's that, that's an interesting thing because I have a cousin who did used to go all overseas for quite a few ski trips. Like, and I think they were like, I think there's jobs 
to do with like working in ski resorts that I don't know why they specifically would have foreigners to do that job compared to people within their own country, but I think there are jobs for ski instructors. So maybe there's that. Yeah, could be. Uh, next question. There's a scene in Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards where Michael oh. Fassbender's British spy, disguised as an mm. SS officer, is questioned... that to do with their fingers? Is, no. Is questioned about which region of his German accent originates from. <laughs> if this scene had Australians speaking English, would you be able to pick out their regional accents? Weird. Weird. Que- like, good question, but weird to think about because... You think about, I I think about this a lot in terms of dialects. I think Melbourne kind of has one. You can hear it in Rosé. Rosé from Blackpink is is an example of it because she has a very Melbourne accent. And then maybe if you compare her to, like, for for whoever is asking this question, compare Rosé from Blackpink and how she speaks to Danielle from New Jeans and how she speaks because Danielle is coastal and she's from Newcastle, which is in New South Wales. But it's a very, very subtle difference. Yeah, um, I can't pick it. I've lived in Australia no. all my life, and I've toured yeah. around the country a lot. And yeah, I, like for example, and, yeah. yeah, I cannot pick someone's region no. from their voice ever. No, no, because like it's so different. It's funny when you think of size wise. Australia is a huge country, and in quite a few different places. For example, you're in South Af- South South, Af- South <laughs> Australia in Adelaide, yeah. and then you got Perth, which is over in Western Australia, and that's even more isolated from New South Wales. But I think it's like. Part of it is that we're all raised on the same TV, the same music, the same cultural stuff, that it's like you don't have too much of a cultural difference between the different states and capitals compared to, say, like, you think about the size of Britain. You think about, like, the UK and England and, like, just how short the difference between, say, like, if you speak to someone in London and they've got more of the posher accent and they're speaking more towards the front of their mouth and they're very refined and quite polite... But then if you talk to someone who's got a bit more of a chav you go out around that area, it's like, you know, that's such a drastic difference in mm. their pronunciation. Like, you get the poorer, and I'm using, like, like the, the socioeconomic difference. It's like you're cutting out the letter T if it's in the middle of the word. Mm. And then, like, I'm not even going to try to do a Cockney accent. That would be ridiculous. So it's like you think about the UK, and that's so much smaller than us, and yet they have such wide dialects. And America is like, you've got a whole different, it's almost like the different states are almost different countries. But Australia, it's really not that different. Speaking of which, you seem to have slightly more of an American accent from last time yes, we spoke. Yes, that's, that's the autism. Happening? Is it? Yeah, that's the autism. So basically, autism is part of my interest in language and like accents and dialects and whatever. And I think it's partially because of just like, again, maybe I'm doing a Buffy marathon at the moment. I think I do it unintentionally if I'm like recording stuff because like if I'm casually speaking with friends or whatever, I don't really speak that much. Whereas if I have to do it, have to do, I'm doing this by choice, I swear. Uh, <laughs> gun to my head. Oh, um, I didn't force like her, I I'm, promise. Yeah, but like for a podcast or whatever, it's like I'm forcing myself to speak. So it's like I kind of almost go into presentation mode. Right. And that tends to gear towards an American accent, which is easier for people to understand. Because with the Australian accent, we're a bit more nasally. Um, and also we don't enunciate certain sounds compared to an American accent. So for Americans or for Australians, if we think of the letters E-R, like teacher, after, whatever. In the American accent, you're saying that er, after, teacher. But Australians, what up? Teacher, Arvo, I, we like I, to shorten things. I don't understand where the autism comes into it, though. Uh, autism is all about imitation and observation, and it also makes you a bit more attuned to that kind of thing as well. So when I was growing up, people, and this does relate to it, so I grew up in Perth until I was 16, and then when I moved over from Perth into um, New South Wales, people would say, oh, you've got such a Perth accent, we can definitely tell that you're... Like, nah, mate, when I was on Earth, they were saying the same shit to me as well. People were asking, like, are you Canadian or are you American? And that was because my accent itself, the way that I speak, is a mixture of, like, what I heard growing up around me, which is obviously my parents, my my schoolmates, etc. But it was also very, very heavily American because my favorite movie, 1995, 1995 Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie, loop the absolute shit out of that on a VHS tape to the point that my mum had to confiscate it because she was concerned about how much I was watching it. 
and also again autism there and the um the 50s sleeping beauty movie i those two movies i can quote them word for word and also mimicking the inflections of the way that the characters are speaking so it's not just me saying the same things it's like straight up matching them word for like their tone their pronunciation their accent as well so because i was unintentionally but just the way that my brain learns things copying these characters and copying their speech it then became i guess melded influenced into my actual way of speaking which yep. therefore gets me a bit of an american accent I still tell you're australian because if you put me <laughs> next to my old boss at the last place that i used to work at he is an american so if you put me talking like people would like come in first and they'd speak to me and they'd be like oh you've got a bit of an american accent and then my boss would be like, guy Hey, it's really great to see you. Thanks for coming on in. And they'd be like, oh, okay, you're not American. Yeah. That is my boss. <laughs> he is from California, so he definitely had a real American accent. You put me next to a Californian, you'll understand I'm not actually American. <laughs> <laughs> um, your uh, microphone's cutting in and out a little bit. Like, it's it's what it yeah. is, is it's the automatic... Um, uh, um, it's just nothing wrong with the mic. It's the automatic setting for um like one instead speaker of, at a time no not not that it's like instead of push to talk you know like voice activated turning on and off okay <laughs> like like your voice needs to be fairly high for it to turn on all right <laughs> um so yeah just i don't know if it's fixable or i'll not. keep that in mind i'll keep that in mind <laughs> um anyway i'll move on um more australian questions the typical quick kiwi lunch for blue collar workers is a savory meat pie and an energy drink often uh -huh. bought from the petrol station is this the case in australia as well yeah that's garn servo so there's some australian slang for you garn servo that's the meat pie from the service station um so i'd say that, yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty common for your working class trade yeah I, I, I reckon the farmers union iced coffee might be a more popular pick than the energy drink but maybe times have changed Depends where you are. Depends what you feel like. Like I'd say a V is pretty popular, or yeah. a, or a Red Bull, or a Monster. Monster. Everyone likes a Monster. Yep. Um, in New Zealand, it's also common for petrol stations to have coolers full of ice and fish base bait. Is that the case in Australia as well? Um, yeah, I've heard that in New Zealand you call them chili bins rather than eskies. Um, so that that's the, like a little cultural difference there. Also, you're giving me a bit of war flashbacks with like whoever this is from New Zealand. I'm like, are you my ex? Are you trying to speak to me after I blocked you? I <laughs> uh, fucking hope not. Well, no, no, uh -huh. no one in my questions identified themselves as your ex, so I would, um, let's I would hope, say let's probably hope. not. <laughs> um, Good. Um, but, but yeah, um, yeah, we do have the coolest of ice, um, fish bait, I guess um would yeah, be yeah, less common definitely well depends, depends if where you are no not if in you're near the coast. <laughs> yeah depends where Austrians. you are if you're near the coast yes because i lived on the central coast for a very long time so when i was on the central coast yeah pretty common yeah um here's an here's an interesting one um in the latest aquaman movie the title Ooh. character calls pizza czar Z-A-H. <laughs> I'd never heard of this slang prior. The movie director huh. James Wan is Australian, so is a czar Australian <laughs> slang? Well, it, that's a logical conclusion because so much of Australian slang is taking a word and making it shorter. Like, mm. afternoon, arvo, service station, servo. But mm. I've never really colloquially heard people call pizza, oh, I'm getting some czar. No, I've never no. heard that. No. Like, it rings a bell that maybe I've seen it on TV or something, but um, not in everyday speech around us. Yeah. Um, all right, we're going to move on to some other questions. These are just, like, more random cultural questions. Woo! Um, and oh, this is a long-ass one, so I'll just try and summarise <laughs> it. Um, a gaming journalist recently had this hot take about uh, Elden Ring. Do you agree with her? Um, now, yeah, I'll just read this first bit out. So mm. this IGN editor recently claimed in a video discussing this game, um, that having a two year old is a situational disability. <laughs> she, she stated, I'm not actually asking for an easy mode. This isn't the intent. 
This is the thing I want to spell out with accent where accessibility is concerned. From there, she listed out a number of types of disabilities and said, there are also multiple types of disabilities where gaming is concerned. Um, specifically discussing Elden Ring, she said, it counts as a disability where Elden Ring is concerned if you have a kid. You have a two-year-old, you're trying to play Elden Ring, you can't pause the game. That's a, situ a situational disability that you have where the game doesn't have the option for you to pause, so it's a hindrance because you may need to pause to stop your kid from putting a fork into a socket or something like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's basically the crux of it. What do you think? Um, I wouldn't use the word disability, but I understand the concept of what the person is saying. Like, in a lot of cases... I guess you then go into the semantics of disability, and it's like, well, I think with disability, it's not something you choose to do to yourself. It's often how you're born, whereas for a child, uh, hopefully, in most circumstances, you're consenting to having one. So I'd say that's your major difference. Um, yeah, that's with... it. It is a choice. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, you don't have to have children. Hopefully. Well, yes. Well, and that yeah, for, ironically for <laughs> is also a big factor of why I personally, now being 32 and in the, my uh, very much in my hag era, do not want children. I've been very outspoken about this since my pretty much early to mid-20s. I very much knew that this was very likely to not be a thing in my life. And, you know, how people are like, oh, you'll change your mind when you get older. I'm like, if anything, the older I get, the more reason i have to not want children biologically um yeah. just reinforces i think like for me on one part it's the fact that it would be very very difficult for me to have them because i have funnily that we're mentioning the topic of disability it's like you know you've got it's not that autism or adhd means you can't have them but and it again it depends person to person because i know some people with autism and adhd who are fantastic with kids and then on the other hand there's people who are very much like me and i've met others who are like oh dear god having a child sounds like an absolute nightmare and like it's the sensory overload of a child it is how loud they are like you hear a kid scream in a shopping center and i like i i wear headphones literally i am that cliche autistic because whenever i hear like shrieking it just is like a drill to my head and i'm like i'm not gonna why would i want that in my house for the rest of my life i can't do that um and the the thing that she's mentioning as well in terms of like you've got a tiny child like, toddlers are fucking insane. Like, they actively just have n no regard for their life. And I get it that it's not their fault. It's just how humans are, that at that age, we don't have that capacity in our brain to recognize danger. But the, the I am ve someone who is OCD. I have, like, uh, I'm, I'm ticking all these different, like, ana not anagram, but the letter boxes of all the things that you can potentially have wrong in a person. But it's like, I am so anxious and I do have OCD symptoms and like, oh, I would not get a moment rest for the solid 18 years and then beyond that it is to be a parent because I would constantly be living in a state of paranoid fear of like, I can't see my child. What are they, are they sticking a knife inside of a toaster? Uh, have they gotten out the back door and somehow fell into a puddle and managed to drown themselves? Have they run into traffic? Like I went working in the city. Uh, I saw it once where I was next to a parent who had a child who was maybe like a little bit older, maybe four or five, and the child just bolted to try and run onto the road, even though it was not a green light to walk on. And like, it was just this natural instinctive reaction the parent had where they just like grabbed them and just caught them before they got in front of a car. And that was terrifying to watch. And I'm like, that terrified me, not even my kid. So it's like, I could not deal with that situational disability in air quotes i'm like no could not deal with it don't want it never will i understand yeah. what they're saying and what they're saying is if anything a choice for me to never want to have a child <laughs> and i guess in that kind of circumstance i guess i just make the recommendation of play the game when you've got the kid in a with a babysitter or like with the other parent or in some sort of situation where you don't need to be micromanaging them but yeah, it's like, oh, you made the choice to have that kid. Mm -hmm. That's a hard choice. Yeah. Um, 
that dusts off another question I had later, which was about someone actually did ask why you don't want to have children. So, yeah, thanks oh, for that. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I can go into more details if you want. <laughs> oh, no, that's okay. I get it anyway. I'm, I'm, I feel much the same about yeah, you're it. You're child-free yourself. So. I'm child-free. Like, again. My, my, I reckon my partner shit. hates kids even more than me. She actually told me that today. So that's actually, well, that's an interesting thing because I will say that, like, you know, when it comes to being child free and not wanting kids, there is that stereotype of like you being a bitter cat lady who hates kids. I love kids. I actually mm. genuinely do love children. I love being a part of the lives of my friends who do have kids. I love spoiling the kids that they have and like being mm. the cool aunt figure who like buys them presents. And like, I like to play with kids, I like to play with babies, but it's just like, I don't have the capacity to do that as like forever and yeah. i would rather recognize that and then maybe regret that later as mm. someone who's then capable of processing that regret assuming i live long enough compared to the other way around of oh well what if i just do it because i think i want to and then everyone says it, and then oops i regret it but now i can't get rid of this child and i wouldn't want mm. to get rid of the child so it's just oh too much uh also i'm poor as shit uh i came from a, like I'm not, hmm. Well, there's other people who are financially worse off than I am, but I grew up with, as an only child, my parents are working class. I am the first person from my side of the, from my family to graduate from university. To even, my parents both did not go to university. My mother uh, was, still is, uh, my parents are both very talented in art. My mom did really well, offered a place at like an arts university to like do art and uh, she turned it down because she could not afford to do it. And mm. it's not even just like the scholarship side of things. I think uni was probably free back then, mm. but it was like she wanted to get out of where she was living. She wanted to work to make money because mm. that was just not a thing in her time was having money. Yeah. So it's like if my parents worked really, really hard to base themselves out of that level of living. And then my upbringing was not dirt poor i always had a roof over my head and food on the table but there were a lot of things that other kids my age had that i didn't and i recognized that and i knew it and they knew it and i got picked on for it in school so i've always ever since i was a kid swore that like unless i get rich and i can like do this for my kid that i don't have now that i don't hit and yeah obviously finances haven't really improved that much since then uh, <laughs> again it's like reason, 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 reason. So I can like boom, 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 boom. Just like talk for ages about all the reasons I have to not want a child. Other genetics, shit that like mm. I had a near death experience. And it's like, why would I have a kid if I could hereditarily pass on that illness and shit that I've got going on in my body to them? Because like the biggest thing, there's this philosophical question, I guess, that I've created from my life circumstance is if I was born again and I knew what was going to happen in my life and there were certain just core life events that were unavoidable my core life events are the worst moments in my life and the best moments of my life and no matter what i did i couldn't change that course of history if i had to experience my life all over again from the moment i was born up until where i am right now would i do it hell no i would choose death in a fucking snap heartbeat so that then comes to me is like well if i would not choose to be alive why would I then choose to inflict life upon another person? Mm. And that is your biggest reason why I don't have kids. There and also go. when I say that I like kids, I would, again, I much, I'm much more invested or interested in improving the living circumstances for other people, especially young people, kids coming up in the future. So like, mm. I love the idea of fostering, but do I have the mental, financial, physical capability to do so? Not quite. Will I ever, yeah. if I ever do one day, would, but hell no for hmm. the biological cool let's move on um yeah. do you think that americans have self-control problems when it comes to eating or do you think that there's genuinely <laughs> ingredients difference in from the rest of the world in their food that makes them really fat uh, bullying americans haha ha, funny um i think it's a bit of both uh i don't necessarily think it's just like oh self-control lazy you're fat therefore it's your fault it's more to do with one, the regulations in their food are different from Australia. Mm. It's like it can be the portion sizes. It's also in the ingredients as well. So it's like, yeah, there is a lot of things that are in their ingredients that are like deliberately there to make the food addictive and like to almost like not make you full so that you eat more of it and mm. crave the food, especially the sugar content. A lot of it as well is to do with like the work-life balance as well. Like we're all in late stage capitalism hell. 
but and like I struggle with it here in Australia, and I'm sure an American would as well. Accessibility to fresh food, because if you're an American, some places it's like you got to travel to a supermarket that's 30 minutes away, and you got to drive there, and there's no transport. You can't like they they make jokes about walkable cities, but it's like those things are great. They're very convenient. I think you should want them, but. American is very much like cars, transport, got to drive my car to the supermarket that I can only go to and buy everything in bulk. And it's like, well, yeah, how are you meant to get fresh produce when there's no access to being able to buy those healthier types of foods that are, yeah. And then like, again, anything that's organic, way overpriced purely because you're slapping an organic label on it. So it's just, yeah, it's to do with the ability to access healthier food and the time it takes to access the healthier food and the regulations about what can be put into the packaged food it's just it's it's a big combination it's not a very good one mm-hmm. um i'll abstain from that one because i'm not really experienced in the ways of american food um but what you're saying makes sense to me um have you read any of the k Lips books yet I want to. I haven't yet, though. I would like to. Cool. Um, I uh, apologize for not reading them. That's all right. There's, quest, there's a question about it, but I will not ask it to you because you haven't read them. So never mind. No, I'm, I'm generally a person who reads on like a physical copy of a book rather than a PDF. And from what I've seen, there's links to like the Amazon stuff. But I'm guessing there is a way to purchase it as a book from Amazon. Yeah, like, yeah. There, 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 is, there is paperback links for all the books. You can get a paperback nice. from I'll Amazon of all of them. Oh, good. And I remember you saying that, like, the last one you've published is the last one. So I'm also the kind of person who doesn't like starting a series until it's actually finished. Yeah. So now that they're all available, I can kind of be them. Cool. Well, yeah, they're all they're all done. That series is done. There will be more books, but it'll be and it'll be all in the same universe because creating a fictional mm. universe is difficult. So mm. I, there's mm. no and because all my writings on one particular subject, which is K-pop, there's no point mm. starting from scratch and. You know, might as well keep using the same universe, right? So makes sense. Um, so there will be more books, but it'll be a whole new story. Um, so, but yeah, so I'll, the first series is out for books. Um, yeah, so there's ebook and paperback. Ebooks a lot cheaper, like a lot cheaper. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's because printing paper costs money. Yeah. Um, it's you know um, unfortunate, but is, this is yeah. the way it is. Um. Next question. Were your expectations successfully subverted when the ending of Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood diverged from the actual historical events? Yeah, that was weird. I remember watching that and I'll be like, didn't they die? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah that, that is a plot twist. I'll give him that. I guess the same thing happened in Inglorious Bastards, too. Um, I, was, yeah. I was expecting it to sort of fit in with history a bit, and then at the end, it just went mm. rogue. I was like, oh, okay, well, you can do that if you want, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess so. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, yeah, once upon a time in Hollywood, it did sort of surprise me a bit at the end. I was like, oh, okay, he's, mm. he's, he's done an Inglorious Bastards again. He's just sort of done mm. it the way he would like to do it. And But yeah, yeah cool, whatever. Um, another Tarantino question. In Pulp Fiction, were you annoyed by the fact the audience never got to learn what was in the suitcase? What's in the box? <laughs> What's in the box? But um, I think, what did I read? I read something about that once where it was like, apparently they do know who made the film, but they're never going to confirm it. So it's like, fuck you. Uh, the most interesting theory that I heard about it was that, um, you know how uh, Ving Rhames, I can't remember his uh, his um, character's name. Is it Marcellus Wallace? Or is it the... Um, yeah, the 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 boss gangster. You know how he's got a band aid on the back of his um, neck mm. in one scene when he's talking to Bruce Wells, um, mm. Ving Rhames character. But the theory is that the um, the what's in the suitcase is his soul, and oh. that it was extracted through the back of his neck, which is why he's got the band aids there, and that's why he wants it back so badly. Oh, that's interesting. I could like that. Um, yeah. hmm. but, um, it's like I can, I can be annoyed at the fact that they don't say what it is but then the fact they don't say what it is is obviously generated conversation that's been going for like 20 years now so it makes sense sometimes they don't <laughs> hmm. 
Next question. If you found your friend or associate claimed to have gotten depressed and dumped their significant other who was actively fighting cancer or a similar illness, how would you feel about them? Ooh, I've heard of this. Uh, I am, I've read statistically that it's so much more likely to happen like men dumping. It's like six times more likely or something insane. That the man dumps a woman because yes. she's going through cancer yes. or something and he doesn't want to yes. deal with the emotional yes. support. Look, look that up. Look, Yeah, like look up the statistic on that because mm. it's insane how bad it is when it's the woman who's diagnosed. Like I've heard about doctors actually warning the woman who's the patient at their diagnosis because of how common it is. <laughs> Your man will probably dump you. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, um, I I don't know. Um, I guess it would, yeah, it would really depend on the circumstance. Mm. Uh, it would really depend on the friend, but I like to think that I've got the kind of friends anyway who wouldn't be that kind of person. Because, yeah. Um, yeah, the funny thing about me and my friends is ability or chronic illness. <laughs> so it's just like, yeah, if anything, it's just like, why are you, why are you surprised if, mm. if anything like that happened? Um, yeah. Something that I will say is like, I then... Like, hearing and reading about all that kind of stuff that can happen in those worst-case scenarios does make me appreciate my father and my mother's relationship. Because, like, with my dad, that is a man who loves his wife, never even having to consider that possibility. Because, like, my mom, uh, she's had some health issues over the last, say, two years, probably. Hmm. Like, she's had to go to hospital, she's had to have surgeries, and, like, never a doubt in my mind about my dad. Yep. because he's the one taking care of her. He's taking her to her surgeries. He's taking care of her after she gets out. Yep. Um, he's working a, a job as well to be able to like bring a little extra income in while they're having to afford appointments that she needs to go to. And mm. yeah, again, there's just never a doubt in my mind. That's just, that's a man who loves his wife. So yep. yeah, when I, when I have my little grump about my shit cunt Evan X potentially messaging, me, <laughs> messaging you from a burner <laughs> account, it's like, a big part of why I was able to like leave that toxic situation ship is just the mm. fact that like when I told my dad about it, mm. he was just like, "That's not a, how someone treats someone that they love. That's not someone yeah. how they treat someone. That's not how a man treats a woman that even." So I was just like, "Yeah, you, you kind of got a point." So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that rings true for me also. Yeah. Um, next question. I heard recently that when Billie Eilish tried to dress adult slash feminine and ditch her oh, yes. androgynous baggy clothes she was shouted down by a vocal contingent of her fan base i heard that this partic <laughs> i heard that this particular part of her fan base are borderline pedos do you think that these supposed people who can only objectify adult women if they're dressed like teenage boys are real it wouldn't surprise me um <laughs> because like the thing about like again i don't want to be making comments on her body type but she debuted or like she had her first album like she's been in the music industry for a very long time and i'm pretty sure she was like 15 or 16 mm. when she first got fans so it would not surprise me if therefore she had people who were pedophiles as part of her fan base mm. and why she covered her body she said before is the fact that like she was very young but her body because you know boobs don't magically just pop up when you're 18 for a lot of girls they can early so, like, she was well endowed as a young girl, but she covered herself up to prevent herself from objectifying. It's just horrible that she had to do that. So she then, you know, as people do when you grow up and are still a young adult, she then, you know, wears a more form-fitted outfit, maybe tries to embrace the fact that she's a woman and the shape of her body and she likes her body. And then all of a sudden it's like, you doing that, you said you were doing it. It's like, that's let her do whatever the fuck she wants with how she looks um so i don't have much of an opinion either way on how she dressed because again it's just not my business but i think it is sad that she then feels that she can't dress how she wants either way because if mm. she dresses too baggy then it's like oh she's not a girl she's not mm. feminine and it's like maybe she wants to be feminine i mean the fact that she was trying out style does show a hint of that thing she wanted at one point. and then now she feels she can't do that because or, you know, this is fake. It's not who you really are. You're but cutting out quite a lot. People. But, mm. you, but, yeah. But Sorry. I'm, I'm hearing enough words to get the general gist. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you had the idea. Yes. Yeah. Um, I wrote about that in one of my posts um, a while back, that it's possible to be too sexual and not sexual enough at the same time yeah. in the entertainment industry. Thing. Yeah. 
And she definitely seems to fit into that, I think, for some people. Yeah, um, it's horrible. It's like the people who became fans of her for the wrong reasons when she was 16. It's like they want her to stay in that image so they can basically still imagine she's 16. Yeah. Um, next question. Would you think less of a man if you took on his wife's surname? No. Mm. Depends. Like, I don't really, again, it's when it comes to that side of things, I'm, in, I'm very indifferent about other people's relationships because it's like, that's not my business. That's not yeah. my problem. Um, if I was getting I've married, I'd, I'd, I'd take her surname if it was a decent one. Mine's stupid. Exactly. That's what I was thinking of. Cause like <laughs> my surname's all right. I don't really like, I don't love or hate my surname. I'm just mm. like, yeah, that's my name. Mm. So if someone else had like a really cool name, then like, I don't care if it's a guy or a girl. If got the cooler name you should go with whoever has the cooler name <laughs> <laughs> makes sense uh do you have any evidence that could lead to the arrest of hillary clinton mm, not personally okay <laughs> easy question all right so <laughs> the next the next bunch of questions again are the silly questions now okay um i got a whole bunch of questions over about a year someone just kept, <laughs> kept they're all the same and they're just asking <laughs> do you find so-and-so fappable Okay, um, so it's going to just... be a lot of no's from me probably, but let's probably. go. <laughs> so let's go. Um, I'll just list out the people and just tell me what you think. And right. I, and I, in very few cases, most of these people, I don't even know who they are. I think they're All mainly right, actors. Um, oh, I think we're fucked. I think they're mainly male actors from films, but I don't know. Oh, um, we are fucked. <laughs> <laughs> first one is Ansel Elgort. Oh, no, he's a predator. He, like, basically got cancelled, cancelled because he was a predator. So, absolutely not. I'm going to look each one of these up so I can give an opinion as well. Um, he's not ugly, but I don't think he's hot either. And then the fact that he ended up being a predator who, like, preyed on, like, a very young girl while he was a celebrity is very ill. So, absolutely hard no from me. Hard no for Ansel and Gort? Okay. Um... Yeah, yeah, he's. I mean, as a heterosexual man, I, I don't really have <laughs> a have a have an opinion on any of this stuff. But, um, but I'm looking at him, and I'd like to think that if I was gay, I could do better. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, who knows? Um, all right, Henry Golding is the next one. I know the name, but he's... for some reason, my brain is saying Henry Cavill. So I've got to look it up. Henry Golding, apparently the actor from Crazy Rich Asians, which I haven't seen. Oh, oh, I understand he's very conventionally attractive. I understand why people find him attractive. I am just, I don't think I'm attracted to men. <laughs> <laughs> I like, it's one of those things where like, I get why I think he is good looking. But like, if I uh, like, again, I've been, I've become a bit more outspoken on it, but I'm now more of a private person. So maybe whoever is asking these questions doesn't quite realize this. I am on the asexual spectrum, so basically I could count, and this is including celebrities, but more importantly, people I know in my real life as well. I could count the number of people who I have been attracted to on my hands and have fingers left over. So I can give you like a rating on if I think they're good looking, but if you think, if like I would actually have sex with anybody probably not it's good probably going to be a no from like everyone so i'll just rate them on like do i think they are good looking i understand why people think he's good looking yeah well, well the question is fappable but you can interpret that as um, yeah because like, i don't really fap <laughs> you, you can <laughs> interpret really. that as um just do i think they're yeah. attractive flash good looking yeah. whatever yeah. works for you yeah. whatever works for you yeah otherwise um, it's going to be a very boring segment of no's <laughs> yeah um yeah, um, as a, as a gay man who isn't gay, um, mm. if I, yeah, I'd I'd rate him above the first one. Yeah, definitely. Just so, so far, we're, just because yeah, the other guy looks on a like a rating tier system where we'll compare whoever the last one was with whoever we think is the better looking. So right now it's like Henry Golding is better looking than Ansel Elgort. So we'll see who who's next. I just I just uh, you know it's no attraction in my case. I just like his vibe yeah. a bit better just because he doesn't look like a kind of a slimy kid basically yeah yeah, the guy yeah, yeah like, he actually looks like a man yeah he looks like a man the other guy looks like a slimy kid i would not let him real you know into yeah. my orifices um let's <laughs> move on um next, next one next one is daniel brule um how do we spell the last name that's b-r-u-h-l this is frederick zola in inglorious bastards which i don't remember who frederick zola was okay zemo in captain america civil war okay I, um 
Oh. I think Henry Golding is better looking. I, when again, kind of thing like I get why some people might be attracted to him, but that's not really my idea of good looking. But I, again, he's not ugly. Hmm. Oh yeah, but in, not my type of. Life. Oh yeah, in Glorious Bastards, he was the 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 young German sniper who was a movie oh, star. Yeah. Um. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So I still got Henry Golding as the winner. Yeah, I think Henry Golding's still the winner for me mm. so far. Mm -hmm. um, Nineteen ninety slash early two thousands era George Clooney. Ooh, good choice. Um, yeah, I would say that with like, if I, I'm putting ninety, I'm putting two thousands Clooney into my search bar. Mm. Like, I get him being a, considered a handsome man. Um, again, not my type. But I get it. Mm. Um, and I think there's such a thing at the moment now where, like, the celebrities that are coming out, like, especially the male celebrities, like, what's passing for a teen heartthrob or a sexy heartthrob right now, they aren't on what the level that George Clooney or Leonardo DiCaprio, they, they ain't what they used to be, I'll say yeah, that. They don't yeah. make them like they used to. <laughs> yeah, I think Clooney's got a bit of that sort of... Um... Uh, classic Hollywood vibe to him, like he could have been yeah. a uh, 1950s or 60s yeah. male heartthrob. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So I think that's you know, I can see him that mm. next one's Tom Holland. Oh, way too young for me. He's he's cute. Tom Holland. Who's Tom Holland? I don't even know. Spider Man. Um, oh, Zendaya's boyfriend. All right. <laughs> yeah, this is a kid. Yeah, is a like, kid that with... is a fetus. That is a child. He's, he's 27, he's... but that's a child. <laughs> he, he's a kid with a jawbone. Yeah. Yeah, he looks... Bless his heart. I yeah. think he's adorable. I like him, but as like a son. <laughs> <laughs> um, next one is Austin Butler. Ooh, I actually saw him recently in Sydney when he was doing the movie premiere for The Bike Riders. Mm. Good looking guy, but again, he's almost like... I mean, for me to then go from saying they ain't making them like they do to this guy's like almost too pretty boy. Um, mm. Again, good looking, but like I, I, I prefer more of the, um, I guess, rugged rather than like chiseled. He's mm. very chiseled, but soft as well. It's yeah. like, again, great model face, great model face. Mm. Yeah, he's a bit... Um... Yeah, he's 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 like the he's like the guys that David Lynch should always cast as leading mm. men in his his eighties and nineties stuff. He's got that mm. sort of vibe, mm. um, sort of the the fifties throwback, um, yeah, sort of style. Bit of a James Dean in a way, mm. but like pretty. Next one is Timothy. Ch I'm not probably not spelling <laughs> Timothy Chalamet. Chalamet, yeah. Very not my type. Very not my type. Yeah, let's have a look. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or me. Is, oh, don't, don't. No one tag Club Chalamet in the replies because <laughs> he's um, got like a rabid fan account. So. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about like Koreans and their plastic surgery. Americans. They've got beauty standards too for their men. They're just different. Yeah, the, the men. Yeah, the male beauty standard is a bicycle seat for a jawline. Yeah, yeah, and he's got that. He's really got yeah. that. And yeah. like the the point oh 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 one percent of men and women who have this bicycle seat jawline, they all seem to get gigs in Hollywood for some reason. Yeah, Natalie Dwyer is like the female version. Yeah, I she's don't in know. Stranger Things. Oh, okay. Um, I'll look her up. <laughs> Look her um, up and she'll see the same jawline. Same one. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, both are a hard note for me. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd say he's the worst one, actually. <laughs> yeah. next, next one is Glenn Powell. Oh, hell yeah. I loved him in Top Gun. That oh, is actually someone who I would, like, potentially... <laughs> actually consider fappable like right. that is hey. my man no okay there you go i think i think we've got a winner from my end i was like wait if this name came up in the list because i'm like that is my man yeah okay yeah um 
Yeah. Trust me, he's like the movie. It's like, you know, if you look at him in a photo, he kind of mm. looks like if a capybara came to life as a human. Seen yeah, I see that. Tweet before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw that tweet. I love that tweet. Um, but yeah, it's like in the movie in Top Gun Maverick, he's got that like really good back like the cop but then actually being a good guy and i'm like oh that that, that 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 works only for such a small number of people but it works for you <laughs> cool cool all right um alan alan richardson oh let's have a look at that i know the name i just have to look richardson alan, I don't know him. I'm again i've got oh okay it's very super, buff yeah, super buff, buff dude. man hmm. buff man I'm pretty sure he's the guy who's, like, in that cop show, but, like, Republicans got mad at him because he's actually, like, quite left-wing. Um, mate, is acting debut in Aquaman? Yeah, Reacher. Yeah, Reacher. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, like, Reacher is, like, this six-foot-five kind of rogue cop thing, and, like, a lot of the Punisher-type conservatives really love that character. And then he made a post that was something like, say Brianna Taylor's name or something along the lines like he mentioned a black person who had been the victim of police violence who mm -hmm. had lost their life to police violence and yeah he was very much on the side rightfully of mm -hmm. uh the victim yep. and then like all the maggers came out and were like oh can you, you get because he's playing a cop but then he was like hey this cop someone that's bad yeah, and they yeah. lost their shit. So I kind of he gets points for that. <laughs> cool. All right, that's the last of the fat ones. Although someone mentioned that they did finally find they finally found a Vin Diesel fapper. Apparently, Australian <laughs> far right political commentator Sidney Watson is a big fan. So there you go. Um, <laughs> there we go. Match made in heaven, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. All right, now um, the next lot of questions is only two. These are what I'm going to call the scrotum skin questions. Ooh. Um, first one, you're in a crashing plane with the CEOs of Big Hit, Pletus, Source Music and Ador, but there are no parachutes available. Would you use your superpower of generating <laughs> unlimited scrotum skin to provide all of them with <laughs> makeshift parachutes? Mate, I'm the one driving the plane and I'm crashing it. <laughs> it, doesn't say you're, it doesn't say you're driving, it just says that you're, you're in the plane with them. Yeah, well, I'm in the plane crashing. as the pilot. <laughs> Um, Who do you think's making the plane crash? <laughs> <laughs> you think you're responsible for it. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, that, that'd be a no. Um, the next one, if there was an intense fire which put Sungri and the other convicted mob sharers in the burn ward, would you use your superpower of generating unlimited scrotum <laughs> skin to help them? Who do you think set the fire? <laughs> <laughs> but then, But then, on the one hand okay but on the other hand you have the potential to um Only have, the, on have their them face. living have them have them live with scrotum skin on their face for the rest of their life on their face on their face okay so if it was like an arm you would know but face yes nah. yeah right gotcha all right you've been uh, very... no, I'd ma I'd, no i'd make him like harvey two-face from batman so like half scrotum half burn <laughs> cool um all right well you've been very tolerant putting up with those questions so the last questions mm -hmm. are going to be the wrestling questions Woo, pop so first one and i don't know what this means hopefully you do <laughs> let's have a look if you were to pick a k-pop song as a wrestling ring intro for a heel character um what would it be what's a heel character i don't know so heels are the bad guys right um yeah. So if you're coming out as the villain mm. or, like, the bad person in a match, who would you, like, yeah. what song would you pick to be, like, I'm so bad? Uh, I'm pretty sure Stacey's so bad. Uh, I'm so bad. <laughs> I, I, that, maybe that's not Stacey. Oh, fuck. I apologize. Uh, my, my, my mind just blanked. That's Luna, not Stacey. Oh, my God. Orbit's going to shoot me on site for that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, they already want to anyway, so all the more reason. <laughs> They get one shot now. They get one free shot. Um, let's see. I have actually, of course, given thought to this. Um, I like <laughs> the idea of um, Esper's next level because, like, that's very co Like, the lyrics, unfortunately, translate more to shit about Kwang Yo. Yeah, song all, that it was that based nonsense. off. Yeah. Yeah. If the original English song it was based off came from the fast 
and Furious soundtrack, and it's like, I'm on the next level. Yeah, I know you heard about it. That's because I'm bad about it. Would you? I'm like, it's, it's like, I'm so bad. I'm like, hmm. hey, if I could get like an alternative English version of the demo song, yeah. then like, yeah, that, that's probably what I'd go. All right, I was losing you a bit there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so, also, please pick a K-pop song for a heel stable. I don't know what that means. What's a stable? Ooh. Stable is like a faction. So, um, if you remember, like, NWO, which was, like, Hulk Hogan, Kevin Nash, I think. Uh, uh, I, I got oh. no idea. I don't know. Well, so, what they, what they group up and have, like, a... Yeah, um, the, yeah. When you group up together, it's kind of like you know, K-pop, like the <laughs> yeah, subunit, or like it's the it's the collab stage between right. the different idol groups. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, that's a tough one because I know next level for me, but I don't know. Heels. Uh, that's a hard one. That's a good question. Hmm. Maybe like, oh, uh, what's that song? Uh, I'm trying to think of the group name. It's not G Idol because, like, I know Soyeon's in the group, mm. but it's the one that she KDA, KDA, yeah. maybe Baddest by KDA. Mm. But that's just an on-the-spot question, so yeah, I don't mm. know. I'd have to give it better thought to get a better, more fit example. Yeah. Um. Someone also wanted to mention since the last podcast discussed K-pop wrestling theme songs, someone had a few more suggestions. One was Sticker from NCT. <laughs> <laughs> also Cherry Bomb. Um, <laughs> uh, Ives Love Dive. Yeah, banger. Yeah, Yeri Band's Romeo Mannequin. Mm -hmm. um, LC9's Mama Beat. Oh, that's a banger. Yeah, uh, Jimin's Puss. <laughs> And <laughs> Girls 2000, Bad Which... Girlfriend. Oh, interesting. So. I don't know if I said it in the last interview. Possibly I did, but I think that WJSN's Babyface because mm. Babyface is like the good guy character. So Yeah, I can't That's remember the what I said. Of the heel. But um, I think um, going with the questions here, I'd say... Uh, Rain's gang is overlooked. Mm. For, I, th I think that's one that would work in a wrestling context. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, last question. This is the last question of the entire thing. So, All right. um, uh, what four people would you put on your wrestling Mount Rushmore? Ooh, that is a fucking question. I'll save the best like, to last. Who... Yeah, that is a good question. Good question. Damn, who do I think is the most influential in it? Because, like, this is definitely going to be, like, my round Mount Rushmore, not who I think is on wrestling Mount Rushmore. Yeah, you're your, your personal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because, mm. like, when it comes to the history of wrestling, the common names you hear for this are definitely Stone Cold, sometimes Bruno San Martino, who's... Mm. Um, some people now potentially saying Roman Reigns uh, in there for that discussion. John Cena is like another, like the Undertaker, no, the most want, famous we, or popular or influential. Yeah. No, so we want your me, opinion here, not not the more popular opinion, but yours. Yeah, well, mm. Daniel Bryan, straight up, Daniel Bryan, um, arguably one of the best of all time, if not like yeah, he, he's definitely one of the best, if not the best. So Daniel Bryan's definitely up there. Uh, again, because we're going with my personal Mount Rushmore, mm. Zack Saber Jr. Mm -hmm. Like huge, huge fan. So I, I love Zack Saber Jr. He's in there. Oh, this is tough. I've got two more spaces. Um, mm, mm, mm. Edge for character work. I loved him as a heel. And he's had, like, some of the matches that make me want to be a wrestler, particular WrestleMania against mm. Mick Foley. That match is the match that makes me want to do wrestling, so he's got to be on there for being inspirations behind that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've got, like, oh, how do I, how do, I do the toss-up? Okay, so the last spot, uh, it's either going to be Madison Eagles, who is an Australian wrestler, who does not get the credit and recognition that she should because yeah so much of what wrestling today is kind of comes from her impact and influence especially for women's because like in the era that she as an australian day that was kind of at a time where like women's wrestling was still like the bra and panties matches or the two minute matches mm -hmm. doing like she was working with the men in intergender matches and she like yeah one of the best wrestlers of all time as well so i'm gonna have to put and i'm gonna like i for Melina. So Melina's also in there. 
So okay. I've, I've done five. <laughs> right, Honorable cool. mention to CM Punk as well. So again, like once I get... How do I... So... Yeah, Daniel Bryan, Zack Sabre Jr., Edge, and Madison Eagles. Well, and then I'm also just like continuing to carve away into the hill. And then I'm adding Molina and CM Punk. <laughs> All right. Um, bonus question from me, which is that okay. when you're making these sort of decisions about what wrestlers you like and don't like, how yeah. you... What... what what do you look for in terms of a wrestler that you really like? I mean, because obviously it's yeah. different from other sports so where it's not really, it's much more subjective than a sport that's based on purely performance in terms mm. of, you know, athletic ability. There's all sorts of other factors too. How, yeah. What what makes a real wrestler really hit for you personally? Ooh, good question. Good question. Um, it's like, again, like it's, ha- it's hard to articulate because in, like, as you're saying it, it's so, some of it can really just be like, vibes mm. <laughs> um for me i guess like if you talk about i actually have like even tried to answer this question for myself where i was like everyone says brian danielson or daniel Bryan is the best wrestler in the world what makes him the best wrestler in the world and i've like watched videos and like analysis and podcasts and all that stuff where people then go on to like talk for hours about what put together makes him so good mm. and you know, this is part of the training process. Is like a huge part of why I'm very self-aware of the fact that I'm probably never going to be good at this. I'm lucky that I can just work a match and be happy pursuing something that I'm just very passionate about. And that, mm. like, for me, that 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 makes me happy. But like, to be very good, it's like there's this combination of so many different factors. Um, something is very underrated, but is a very clear sign of if someone is a good wrestler is what you would basically call your fundamentals. And it's why Brian Danielson himself is the best is because his fundamentals are essentially flawless. And that's your ability to just like do a move, make it clean. It's not sloppy. It's, it looks like it's a real move. (laughs) That mm. could actually hurt someone, but it's also executed in a way that's safe. Mm. It's like safe plus realistic plus the speed plus the strength. It's like so much of it can come to like footwork. He emphasizes footwork as he should. Footwork is something I put a lot of work into. When I first started training, I was very much like and unstable on my feet. Even now, I can still be prone to, you know, stumbling because maybe my balance. But again, it's like that's that difference make something and like oh they're good is just like their ability to hold their back around the strength the core strength to be able to stabilize yourself the mental quickness to be able to adjust yourself in the ring because so much of this is happening at like break and like i'll also give a shout out to eddie guerrero in that regard as his fundamentals like he something that makes someone also really good and again it's a i don't have in awe of anybody who do it is the ability to what's called call on the fly and that's where it's not like everyone says like wrestling's fake no (laughs) calling on the fly is what you're like what's happening between point a and point b and you just have to get from this spot to this spot of the match or in some cases like eddie guerrero he would call an entire match on the fly and that means like you just go in and then you do the match when you're in there and you're basically beating your opponent. You know your opponent's move set so well, you do your own move sets so that you can just like at one point when you got them in a headlock, just say da 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 X, Y, Z, and then you do X, Y, Z. And then pr- move from there, you call it to each other as you're doing it. And like that is such a quick thinking skill. I am shit at it i like you know i can survive doing it but i can't make it look but i can't make it look real mm. and like again when we talk about realism like there's real injuries that have all this kind of stuff that goes on in it and it's just yeah the ability to actually adapt do it on the like do it on the spot and not have everything so planned out in your head than this than this it's the fluidity it's the athleticism um, it's like the height that you get on your jump because a move looks so much better executed if it's like big. And again, I'm like getting all these other names. Carter, for example, he was like the Japan and he joined AEW and it's like his height on his drop kicks is just mm, chef kiss phenomenal and his athleticism 
so much of like how much of your body to the sport and like the innovation that's part of what I want to in- she innovated so much in terms of creating new wrestling and new moves and like doing things that other people weren't doing at the time so again it's like there's not just one clear what I think is very different from what someone else thinks. I mentioned Edge and- so you're becoming you're cutting out a great deal <laughs> yeah um but yeah yeah uh, i could ramble about this for a very very long time just because there's not a simple answer to it because it's like it's a it's not just one thing it's a combination of things uh for the madison eagle side of things as well it's also like what she left and what she continues to do after her in-ring career isn't as i don't i isn't very active anymore she's definitely taken on more of a coaching side but like what she has left for wrestling after not being in the ring anymore it's like paved the way for the women that we see now main eventing um wrestlemanias or participating in steel cage matches on pay-per-views or in the elimination 15 years ago Mm. and she was a part of doing the work on the indie scenes the underground scenes to really put the spotlight on the fact that women are just as capable in a ring as a man is that then led to what women are doing now in the mainstream. Cool. So it's like it's legacy, it's ability, it's skill, it's on the fly. It's 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 like everything. <laughs> cool. No worries. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for participating in the stream and not in the podcast and um Yes. Yes. We'll do it again. Hopefully we'll not leave it quite so long but that also depends on you the listener what you give us uh next time yeah. there's been a few audio problems um where you've been cutting in and Apologies. out but but, oh, but it's all good we'll next time we'll work on it uh we we've, there's mm. still enough in there so you know the gist of what you're saying is not lost so um <laughs> so that's that's fine um but we'll make it better next time and um yeah, yeah and if you want to get more content and what's up to you the listeners so just go on to com and there's a thing there there's a little icon on the sidebar you can submit your questions so do that um and yeah thanks very much for your time and um yeah i'm looking forward to doing it again at some point in the future all right um yeah catch you guys no worries see ya thank you bye